So this session, this webinar is maximising the use of existing data for asset health and risk modelling. Um, and I'm Joanne, um, my email address is at the end and we can get the, um, um, the PowerPoint sent across to you. Um, my email address is, is on there. So just to sort of let you know who I am really. So I'm the head of asset investment management. Um, and as I sort of indicated, it, it, we work as a, um, a company who provides consultancy and software and services to um, primarily network operators, but we've also um, been lately working with um, some industrial customers and we've previously worked with sort of gas customers. But really our um, strength and breadth is within the electricity sector and working with um, electrical utility clients and the owners and operators of, of electrical equipment. Um, OK, so the agenda for today is um, firstly just to have a look at some of the benefits of asset modelling um, and then we'll go on and have a look at the preparing of um, for asset modelling. We'll start to look at some data um, and some data availability and quantifying the data availability. Um, and then we'll look about uh, look at how to generate some of that data as well. So what you can do to, to backfill some of the data points if you, if you don't have them already. Um, have a quick look at data quality and we'll end by looking at the data systems and business as usual activities. And like I say, there'll be time for some questions at the end. Um, and obviously you can put those in the chat. Right, so benefits of asset health and risk modelling. Um, so not, I think there's a big variation of people on the call today with potentially lots of different backgrounds. So we might be covering some ground um, or just cementing some um, thoughts that you've already got. And of course, some of you might already be um, doing this and, and doing this proactively. But some of the benefits. So the, the first real core benefit is understanding the current um, asset conditions. So you can't proactively manage your assets unless you understand the information about them and what condition they're in. So this is really what we class as the foundation step. And we tend to work on the basis that we work on asset by asset so we don't start at the high level um, and and work downwards we tend to work at the bottom level and, and work upwards in terms of what data is available for individual assets now i know that can be quite challenging when you start getting um lots of small um low cost um items um such as sort of service cables and um, LB conductors and things like that. But it does become more manageable, hopefully, once you move up the sort of voltages and the volume are more easy to um, to manage. But this is the, the sort of foundation step. And what we recommend or suggest is that you use your engineering knowledge. Um, so wherever we work, um, we try and harness that engineering knowledge. So there's no point in producing a set of results, a set of outputs about your asset health or condition um, that don't make sense to your engineers. And, and that's one of the tests that you would need to go through or you have you may, may be going through is to look at if the if the asset, if, if, if your engineer knows that such and such transformer or such and such line is in a particular condition, then your asset health needs to reflect that um, that engineering knowledge. And so the way that companies do this is um, by calculating the condition of every asset um, and categorising the conditions to represent assets um, in different formats. And so if you're using health indexes or health scores, then that's great. Um, we'll sort of pick up on examples from um, the common network asset indices methodology. And there's a link to that at the end of the presentation. It's a if you've not heard of it, it's a publicly available um, methodology. It, it's actually designed for regulatory reporting in the UK, but I know companies in the States and Canada and across the world have actually picked up the methodology and adapted it because it's just a fantastic resource in terms of understanding um, potentially what are the most important data points, understanding um, how 
asset health can be li linked to the probability of failure. It provides a great framework for um, understanding the consequences of failure and also for asset risk as well. So it's it's highly recommended that you sort of take a look at that. And it's it's an interesting approach if you've not if you've not seen that already. But lots of our examples are drawn from that. And, and the reason for that is really because it's a publicly available specification. So you can get your hands on it afterwards and, and see how everything's done. Um, so generally in that scale um, and in our examples as we go through, um, a health index or health a health score of um, 0 0.5 um, to 1 is, is a very low score and a result of 10 is a, is a very high score indicating very poor health of an asset and so what you can do with the methodology or um, is you represent your assets very graphically um, and I've put a little histogram on the screen just to show an example of um, this is a typical asset profile it's actually for 3,000 um, primary or what we call primary uh, switch gear which is about 11 kb switch gear um, so it's just a representative set and we'll use that as we go through in some examples um, okay so next benefit really is to understand asset performance um, so to do that you would identify failure types and failure rates um, and determine the relationship between the asset health and probability of failure. And this is a really powerful step um, because suddenly you can understand um, how your failures relate to the condition of your asset. But obviously you need that condition first. And there is some um, understanding of the uh, and recording of the asset failures, which is, is useful in this process. And so on the screen there, we've got sort of similar sort of HI health indices um, and we've got this probability of failure curve. And so what we've done here is to, in a, to enable a clear understanding from um, everybody in the business, we've, tr we've put tags um, along this so we know that we understand that everything at the beginning is as new or it's new and then everything with a higher health index is advanced uh, deterioration um, and again just making this graphical means that you can share this information between all your engineers your field staff and then all the way up to sort of senior management and directors etc so it's it's a good representation of of the um, the assets the next benefit is that you can estimate the future condition and performance of your assets. So you can use the knowledge of how an asset ages um, and you can um, estimate how long it will take to get from the condition as it is now to a condition where you find it to be unacceptable on your on your network or your system. Um, and this histogram um, just shows the transition between year zero and year eight for a population of assets. Um, and you can see that there's a natural transition of everything moving. And this assumes you do, you do nothing. Next benefit is to quantify the impact of the failures. So we, so Common Methodology uses a criticality index and the that's represented on the screen so the criticality index so an index of of one is sort of an average asset and then a higher criticality index is suggests that the criticality is is increasing so by the criticality we mean the importance of the asset so some assets feed more customers for example some assets have a greater um environmental considerations so for example oil fill cables um, and where they're generally located would often have a if, if they're severely degrade, degraded they would often have a higher risk because they would have a higher um, environmental consequences and so it's quite useful to create again a band or a scale and you can represent the health and the, the criticality as a scale or as a risk So in order to represent them as a risk, um, we would 
combine the cough and the and the cough so the probability of failure so this is the um, the performance element which is linked to your condition and the consequences of failure and we would do that for every asset and the consequences of failure in common methodology and, and, and others are in money um, so having a monetized value and bringing everything back to that monetized value is really useful because you can then start adding up um, the, you can start, suddenly start creating a risk value in, in dollars or in, in pounds or whatever currency you're using. And then you can sum up that risk for a, um, a fleet of assets, for a network, for an, um, a line, a substation, a circuit or whatever combination of those. Um, and again, it, it's useful to, to look at that. And again, you can represent those things graphically. The next inter um, benefit is that you can evaluate intervention options. So once you've done the hard work, which is getting your data together, getting your methodology, you, you can then start planning interventions um, and intervention strategies. So this is your proactive um, means of ensuring that that population of assets or, or that network or that circuit remains um, healthy um, throughout the course of um, your custodianship of, of that asset, whether you work with regulatory cycles or, or some other mechanism. At some point, you have to do some business planning and work out how much money you need to maintain the asset population at either a given risk or a risk given failure rate or to a different, you know, to a given um, condition. And so what's on screen is just a series of, of key performance indicators and each line just represents a slightly different investment strategy um, that you can apply to to the assets whether that would be using a sort of mpv um, type um, approach where you're looking at the optimum year of replacement we've also got an age-based approach in there um, and then we've also got a steady um, two percent replacement in there as well and so different replacement strategies will have different costs and they will also have a different impact in terms of the the risk and the numbers of failures um, there's the, there are other webinars that go into much more detail of um, these sort of intervention options so I won't I won't sort of labor the point on those at the minute but it's fair to say you kind of need to do the hard work before you can get to to this point of ever looking at these sorts of um, strategies but once you have got to that point you can align them with um, corporate goals and policies and, and stakeholder requirements and then the final benefit is that you can review and refine information and processes so um, really just learning from the process making sure that you're paying attention to um, failure rates and costs of failures and, and refreshing and updating those to improving your asset data um, as you go along the process and on screen this is just a this is just a screenshot that just shows um, for one asset category in this case towers um, the data points coming into the model um, and then the different populations of data point that has been seen um, as new data has been loaded so again software and software systems are are useful in this in this regard um, and they can be helpful in, in sort of some analytics and and um, making sure that you're moving in the right direction with your data collection. OK, so I'll move straight on and talk briefly about um, preparing for data for asset modeling. Um, so the methodology structure, so I've mentioned already that we use the common network asset and disease methodology or just common methodology for short. So this briefly comprises of a health component, which is on the left hand side. Um, so the health score and probability of failure. And then on the right hand side, we've got the consequences of failure. And in this case, we look at four different categories. So we look at the financial safety environment and network performance, or that's sometimes called security of supply or um, energy not supplied, um, but it's the purpose for the asset actually being there. Um, so these are the sort of two, two halves of the core methodology um, and in the middle we can represent those in the form of a, a risk matrix so that's the basic structure um, that we will use for our example um, so in terms of 
further preparations, things that you need to really think about, um, as well as sort of the methodology and what methodology you're going to use, are the outputs and the reporting. So again, on screen, I've just put some examples. So common methodology uses a health index and a criticality index, and it uses this sort of heat map. And again, it's just a really good visual representation of the fact that You've got the different assets, um, which are the volumes that are represented in the heat map. Um, and it's really easy to communicate and say, right, this is my population of um, transformers or switch gear, or th these are my overhead lines, or, um, you know, this is my substation or my network. Um, so it's quite a good communication tool. Um, and in the actual common methodology, they, the network operators who use that um, produce the current um, risk index and then a risk index in the future and then a risk index in the future without with interventions with investment strategies and the benefit of that is that very quickly it's, without getting lost in all the detail of the assets and the incoming data you can quite clearly see what's going on with each population so again communication is really important so these are clearly software examples but there are um, implementations in spreadsheets in this top right hand corner and um, this is just a spreadsheet version of kind of the similar thing um, but the important thing is that when you're preparing for um, for this kind of activity you really want to understand what the outputs are going to be so that you can make sure you've got the right um, inputs um, the right data points that you're collecting. The next element is just engagement and calibration. Um, so I've put this here just because, again, the software tools out there, we have one, but lots of other providers do as well. And there are in-house systems and the spreadsheets and there's all sorts of different ways of um, sort of engaging with your, your models once you build them. Um, the map view it is really good because again it's really visual and we can use the map view from the most senior level um, down to very uh, you know the sort of engineering level um, within a, an organization it's a great communication tool and in this particular example you can drill into the clusters and have a look at the assets and you can sort of use the filters and things and see what's going on um, and you can move the slider bar and see the assets aging forward and that's all based on on models which are similar to common methodology um, again on the top right and um, this is another spreadsheet example and in this example um, this is just a methodology and what we would recommend is that the calibration of the the models um, is editable um, by at least several, you know, multiple people, by the engineers. Um, and so, for example, in here, we're setting some probability of failure calibrations and they're in blue, um, which suggests that they can be edited um, if necessary. And keeping a record of those edits is, is really useful because as you improve and move forward um, with your modeling and methodology, um, whatever system from whoever or even spreadsheets, I would recommend that this isn't bound up in in sort of code um, somewhere along the line. It's actually visible and you can see the real time changes happen if you need to change those calibration values. The other thing um, we would recommend is um, just establishing a set of terminology. Um, so in this case, this is the common um, methodology terminology. Um, and again, just across a business, just having a clear understanding of what you mean by asset health or um, probability of failure. And that, that helps smooth things along the way so you can all talk in the same, the same language. Right. Let, and then the final thing is, is scaling. Um, so again, if you've got different engineers working on different parts of me um, a methodology um, or modeling, um, then it's useful to agree a, an appropriate scale. So we use zero to 10. We've seen other companies use 100 to zero. Um, whichever, whichever works for your organization. Um, but it, it's useful if they are the same across across the board and then you're always talking in the same language with the same the same meaning. OK. So the next part is around quantifying data availability. Um, so this is really the sort of the 
kind of guts of, of a methodology. And we've chosen primary switch gear in our examples um, and we've chosen the common methodology because you can easily relate to this because you can get a copy of it. So it's quite an onerous list <laughs> um, of inputs. Um, there's about 30 odd inputs um, in the common methodology. And so these are so an asset ID and then some information about categories. And then as we move through, we've got things like the asset age, um, we've got information relating to the location of the asset, observed conditions, measured conditions, and then um, things relating to the criticality of the asset, so connected customers, um, the location of the asset uh, relating to, to safety, um, whether the asset has an oil containment system in it or not, um, and also how accessible that asset is. So is it in a building and underground and difficult to get to, or is it out um, sort of in the field or you know, with easy, normal sort of access? So there's quite a lot of different points in here. Um, and these have very constrained values in common. Um, so where you see where you've got a text um, value, you can only have certain inputs, but obviously um, applying that elsewhere, um, you would want to change those inputs and possibly change um, some of the condition points as well, even if you are adopting a similar approach. So this next slide just tells you approximately in the methodology where all those data points are used. Um, so as I've mentioned, we've got location, observed and measured condition. Um, so there's lots of different data points. But the question then is how important are all these data points? And so we've been doing um, some analysis with some of the, the network operators data. Um, and we started to look at what we would be considering to be the sort of minimum um, the minimum criteria. So for this particular methodology, it's a, an age modified by condition methodology. And that means that we are using age as a basis, but condition is really important. And we, what we're saying is that an asset can only achieve a health index or health score of 5.5, which is about the midway point for a current health index, if it has no condition information. And once it has condition information, we can we can move it further up the health index scale only if that condition information tells us that that asset is in poor condition. And so what makes the asset, the model go? Um, so you will always get a result as long as you have, um, you know what the asset is. So you have an identifier for it, you have a category for it and you have an age. So that's the absolute bare minimum. Um, but that really gets us only to an asset um, an age-based um, condition. And so these are our 3,000 assets and the variability of the condition scores. So we end up with about 50 unique um, health score values in this case on this population. Um, so the expected life is about 55 years approximately. So that's about the limit of what you get with that minimum data set. Um, if that's all you've got, then that's still really useful um, because you can then prioritise your data collection based on potentially your oldest assets. Um, but usually with some, I guess, creative thinking, you're normally able to get a little bit further into the methodology than that. Um, and so the normally available category shown here in yellow um, what we've done here is we've we've given this a priority to um, they don't make the model go, but they really enhance um, the results. Um, so usually you know where that asset is. And so you can use tools or, or information available um, um, freely available to work out how how far away from the coast it is. Um, so in the UK, we have uh, a lot of coastline. Um, I appreciate that. That might not be relevant to everybody on the call, but looking at the distance from coast for us is relevant because, and again, if you are coastal, it's it's relevant because we're looking at things like um, the impact of salt um, and salt pollution. 
altitude's also important for looking at things like icing and and, and that kind of thing um, and then corrosion categories so if you know an asset is in a particularly corroded environment it's quite useful you can put that a category on that or there might be some public um, information that tells you the corrosion category um, for a particular uh, for a particular location so the location information um, and, and those might not be exactly the categories which are appropriate to yourselves um, but you might want to look at things like you know wind and wind direction and, and things like that um, again public sources of information it's usually usually available um, the other things we've added onto that, because it's switch gear, we've got a number of operations, but in, in common methodology, what we're really looking for is anything that's not normal. Um, so we're looking at high duty assets and just separating the high duty assets, which you might know about already from assets which have got just normal duty. Because the way the methodology, this methodology works is that it assumes everything is average and normal unless you tell it that it's not. Um, so we're really looking at exceptions. Um, so even if the engineers are saying, well, I know that asset is high duty and that asset is high duty, then that's still valuable information and you can feed that in. Um, we've got a number of units down there, so not quite as relevant for your point assets. Although if you are um, doing cohorts of populations you might want to use that um, but that where that comes into play is where you are looking at, um, at conductors or um, any other linear assets cables um, for example um, so again that information is really useful and then on the right hand side this is where we've got all the consequence of phase this is all your criticality information so most important thing for that is that the number of customers or um, the size capacity um, if you're looking at sort of higher higher vol um, voltage assets um, but numbers of connected customers or, or you know the capacity is is the most important thing there because that tends to be the biggest driver of the, the consequences um, elements and once you do that so we've and, and again, I've just put the norm, I've just added it to the graph. And um, so we've recalculated our asset health now with um, with those things added and remembering that we stop at 5.5 um, when we've got no specific information. Um, but we've now moved from the sort of 50 um, unique scores and now we've got 209 scores um, in this particular population. So we can already see that we're starting to make the asset results are much more granular now with data which is quite easy to collect and populate and so in this particular population 211 assets have health scores of greater than four and those are, tend to be ones with high duty um, and so you could prioritize those for further inspection um, and then you could get more information to tell you exactly where they are in the health in the health school and you can do this clearly for for any asset class it works for for any of them when it comes to prioritizing the observed conditions and i apologize this is a bit busy this this screen um but what we've got is the different observed condition measures on the left hand side and so each of the answers that an asset can have has been given a weighting factor this, that shows how important it is and this weighting factor is hovers around a value of one so anything less than one improves the health score and anything greater than one makes it worse um, so that's what's going on on this left hand side of the screen and then on the right hand side of the screen we've got what we call a collar and what this says is that regardless of all the other information, how old, young, whatever else is, is going on with it, the health index must, if you have, say, substantial deterioration, the health score must be a value of at least eight. And so this is a, a trap to make sure that we're capturing all the, all the young assets which have got poor condition for, for some particular reason. And so by looking at some of these, and I'll move on to the next screen, we can see where the priorities are the most highest, which are the ones which have got um, the, the highest factors. And so 
in common methodology, that means external condition, um, oil leaks and gas pressure and internal condition and operation. So we're saying basically, if you collect any pieces of information, um, then these are the ones that we, we prize the most, if you like, these are the ones that we set the highest value on. And so anytime you visit a particular um, substation or site, it's worth looking for opportunities to pick these values or uh, to, to collect this, this data and information. Um, and that might be based on prioritization of, you know, the earlier analysis where we're looking at the health and the location. For the measured conditions, um, again, I've done the same sort of thing here. And so that the work, the ones that have the most impact are the partial discharge. And that's not really a surprise for um, for switchgear assets because we know that a lot of assets fail um, for reasons um, related to partial discharge. So if you're going to do any test on the switchgear, then then partial discharge test is the one to do. And that's sort of confirmed in, in common methodology by the fact that it's got a high factor and it's also got a high collar. So any asset with confirmed high um, partial discharge, that's immediately going to help a health score of eight. And the result of that is that it will be immediately sort of on the radar um, for people to look at and, and make sure that some issues are addressed for those particular assets. Um, for the rest of the tests, when we were looking through some um, data, they're actually used quite infrequently. Um, and I think with the tests, it's not potentially worth going to the ends of the earth to get um, all the test data populated because if you know you've got a high partial discharge you know your asset you know your score is going to be at least a value of eight so there's no point in doing an ir test and a doctor test and all the rest of it because you already know your health index is going to be high and so if you're going to prioritize then then you would do that um another just um comment is that on trip tests if you if you do do trip tests at the minute then they're much less likely to occur on assets with high duty. Um, so again, you could look at prioritising the assets with low duty because they're much more likely to stick and, and fail that trip test um, than the, the higher, the higher um, utilised um, assets. So again, you can be quite strategic about what tests you do. Um, and because tests normally cost you something, um, then you know, those are the ones to be strategic about. I, I sort of think with the observed conditions that if you're in the area, if you're in the site anyway, you might as well can collect all the observed conditions um, because you're there and you've already expend, you know, the energy getting there. And so for those ones that I've highlighted, um, we've classed those as being very important. Um, and we've also added an extra one into our consequences. And for common methodology, this tells us information. So this is KVA band per customer. So again, we're looking at quite sort of medium voltage, so 11 KV assets in this particular example. Um, and the KVA band per customer gives us an indicator of what kind of customer that is. So is it an industrial customer or a hospital or some other strategically important building? Or is it feeding, you know, a few farms where the impact may be less severe. But again, to some extent, that depends on how you um, assess customers and, um, you know, whether you tra treat each customer alike or whether you do have a priority for um, certain, certain facilities. And then finally, we've just classed um, fours are, you know, basically everything else with the exception of um, the reliability, um, which is reliability is good for engineers to populate. So if you know you've had a particularly bad batch or set of serial, you know, within a set of serial numbers of a particular asset, then you might flag those because you know those assets are really poor condition. And this is just one way in which the engineers can say, actually, I haven't got any, you might not have any critical evidence, but you still, you still want to make sure that you're capturing capturing that in the methodology that you've got assets which are, are poor condition and you might want to start if they think it's poor they might not know why but it might be useful to start capturing the reasons why and refine that reliability over time but it's essentially in common methodology almost a free input to say 
this is everything else we haven't captured elsewhere. So if you're building your methodologies or considering doing so, then that's a useful um, thing to, to use as a kind of catch-all. Um, in common methodology, we have a customer sensitivity factor as well. Um, so this is for customers on um, that have particular reliability needs. So that might be a medical condition or something, which means that they would be significantly impacted if their power was uh, you know, unavailable. Um, and again, it just depends on you know, how you assess your different customers. So very quickly, we can start sort of saying, well, these are your most important things and these are things that you really need to be capturing. Then we've got um, a comparison of the age and condition. Um, so this graph just shows, so what would happen? So in this case, what I've done is I've actually taken that 5.5 cap off um, the methodology and um, so that we can see our age based results and we can see some of those assets extending up until the 9 to 10 bracket. So these are assets which on an age based profile uh, with no cap, um, you know, we'd be changing those assets. But as you can see from the condition based results, um, those assets aren't there anymore because they've been assessed to be in good condition. And so you might end up doing more replacement using an age based approach than you would do potentially using a condition based approach. Um, and suddenly we've gone from the, the 315 or, or 50 that we started with unique values. We have suddenly got 631 unique values for those assets. And so that shows there's quite a lot of granularity um, there being, um, you know, so you've got much more choice and you can be much more strategic about the assets that you then choose for your your investment strategies. So the next section um, is generating data. I'll try and get through this quite quickly. So um, just generating data. So I've mentioned quite a bit about um, the location already, um, but as well as your asset data, you also need calibration data. And this includes things like failure rates um, and failure modes. And some of you might have done the FAMIR and, and other approaches to look at, at failures and costs of failure. Um, costs of failure, incidentally, um, look at things like SADI and safety and common methodology, although we call them CMIs and CL, so customer minutes lost and customer interruptions, but they are for all intents and purposes, safety and safety numbers. Um, it also references things like the green book equivalent, uh, the green book um, for things like discount rates and um, investments to prevent injury. Um, so government references are quite are quite useful if you've got any of those. And this is really for setting the monetized values of consequences. Um, common methodology is a great great source of looking at you know information um, and where that data has come from um, and again studies and white papers and publications are all really useful and um, so that's generating calibration data and then I think I've got a couple of slides um, so failure rates um, if you don't have failure rate information and we know lots of companies often don't um, and that might be because Failures happen so infrequently um, that they don't really have records or they haven't been keeping records. Um, there's quite a lot of free, you know, resources on, on the Internet. Um, so, again, white papers, um, the IEEE Gold Book and other places are really useful resources. And sometimes, like in the case of UKPN and TAS Networks and SA Power Networks, they will publish um, documents on their websites. Um, and there's just a few of them um, that are listed there that sort of talk about um, failure rates and, and failure information um, all good resources. Um, these are the published transformer failure rates um, from various different sources. So, again, you can use those as well as your own information um, in terms of what makes sense to you and what records you've got. Um, an alternative approach to that is to look at the numbers of things like disruptive failures that you've had um, or failures that you've prevented through good asset management. So, for example, if you've got an asset population of a thousand assets and you replace 32 assets because you know they're in poor condition and they would have failed um, had you not done something about them, then you can estimate a, a failure rate as a result of that. Um, 
and again you can you can put that into your model and then for generating data by by asset um, so I've talked a little bit about the um, the location um, so you can use public information um, you can use engineering judgment um, for certain assets if you know for example when a substation was built you you might be or when a circuit was built then you might be able to cascade that information down to to assets that are co-related um, so that's also really useful um, and you might be able to do some strategic data collection just to to go out and look at different cohorts of assets and generate that all important data that you need data quality um, so just general data quality so just bits that we've um, we would suggest so accuracy um, so if at all possible um, you would keep your data in core systems ideally not in spreadsheets or um, or, or, or anything else um, and you would have a single source of the truth um, so you would know what the source of that data was um, automated data handling wherever possible so try and remove the need for modifying data I know that's not always practical but you know if you can work towards that that's always useful um, validation of data inputs um, so constrained values um, use of well-defined criteria and photographic references is good for things like observed conditions so if you know what each condition looks like and you've got a photograph that's really useful for engineers going out in the field and, and comparing those photographs um, if you are setting ratings and things so if you've got a condition and you're setting ratings so like no con no deterioration um, some deterioration significant um, if you're setting ratings like that we suggest you use four of them if possible because um, we do find that if if you choose five it's human nature to pick the middle one um, and so we've quite often seen that where people just just pick the middle one and not really pay attention but if they if there's four ratings that's that's kind of a bit of a psychological element to that to to actually choose one which is closely aligned with the condition and um, other things we found are allowing inspectors to correct data um, everybody loves to correct people's mistakes on data um, so it, it's a bit like the Wikipedia thing you know nobody's going to sit there and write an encyclopedia but everybody loves to, to change and um, modify bits and, and over time your data will get will get better and more correct um, and the other thing is to collect photographic evidence um, and that can be quite useful if you're doing things like um, checks to see you know that the quality is there um, and the consistency is there between between the different inspectors and you you know your training and and everything is right and it also means that you know if you need a second opinion on something you've got that photographic evidence there timelines um of timeliness even um so timeliness when collecting your data so again just establish routines of i'm sure most of you already do this if you've got your assets um managing your assets well inspection maintenance test cycles and again you can prioritize your um your assets if you're not doing this routinely um taking opportunities to collect data when you visit site especially as i've said that that observed condition data is really useful um, and you might consider for your own methodologies if you have very long inspection cycles and, and we've seen this would say overhead lines they might be sort of eight or ten years what you might consider doing is calculating the health at the point of the inspection and then aging that health forward to the current year and then you're almost looking at every asset based on its current what what you assume to be the current the current health and you're not you, you know if you've got some degradation especially then you know that's going to get only only worse over the inspection cycle so it, you might want to adapt your methodology to to um, cater for that and then finally completeness um, so in terms of completeness of data so in the UK what we've done is we've created information gathering plans um, or data gathering plans and that's just setting out a stall to say that 
this is the information I'm going to collect, this is when I'm going to collect it, and at the time work towards that plan of collecting that information and work to backfill, again, those high priority assets. In the pack, um, the um, PowerPoint pack, there is, uh, which we'll share, there's an information gathering plan um, example from common methodology that we've used. So this is for LV, LV, UGB, and we've got different classifications. So some assets, some elements are essential. Um, so that's, those are the things that make it go. Some are required. So these are your condition points and some are discretionary. Um, so again, just adopting some terminology and, and making a plan and working towards um, filling that plan up um, and collecting that, that right data. And then the final select section, where the sort of time um, we're at, I've got 10 minutes left. So data systems and business as usual activity. So just a quick word on, on this, really. We again, we're not endorsing any particular type of data system um, or, or configuration within your organisation. But what generally we're seeing with customers that we're working with is that they've got some mechanism of sharing data. I think what we've seen is that there, were, there was a big surge of cr creating these big super systems in by major providers and trying to do everything in one or two systems. And actually what we're seeing now is more specialist best of breed solutions coming together, but with a mechanism. And, and in this case, um, on the screen, we've got a, an enterprise integration um, bus. Um, but some mechanism that allows that data to be shared and that that um, that bus will take responsibility of making sure that that data gets from the source to its destination and it will be arrived in the correct format um, and it can be used straight away and that data can be can be shared um, across the business. So it, it sort of does mean you can have more systems and they can talk to one another um, and there's multiple providers of that kind of technology or you might have something like a data lake or some other integration services and things like that but again as we've seen um in our work we've seen these becoming much more prevalent um and there's much less reason to bring everything into one one sort of super system where it doesn't really quite fulfill the values and, and the requirements of, of every user and then finally um just think about the business as usual um, activities. So obviously this, we've talked today quite a bit about the methodology and using data um, for the methodology, but you also need to um, determine your replacements and refurbishments, not just from the condition perspective, but also things that are driving um, policies, um, maybe environmental considerations, um, non-network solutions um, you'll need to combine and, and, and optimize those investments at some point so you're not replacing an asset because of condition and then needing more capacity in two years time so you're already preempting that and then if you've got a plan from you know you want to start tracking that plan through and ideally you end up with this nice sort of cycle of activities which is um in alignment with something like ISO 55000, um, the sort of asset management type policy and the asset management type policies. So in the pack, there are um, links, and um, so my email's on there, and then there's links to the two versions of common methodology. I suggest if you you knew, you'd probably look at the sort of second one. Um, and there's all sorts of great information in there um, and useful advice about creating a methodology. And that's it. So, so that I, I wasn't quite as interactive as I had as anticipated, um, but I realise I probably have more slides than, than the 40 minutes or 45 minutes I planned. But uh, um, we have um, clearly some time for, for any questions. Hi, uh, John. Uh, this is Jeffrey. Uh, I had, I mean, I, I think I, I, I understood, but I just want to clarify because I've been dealing with uh, the local utilities here, and there was always a back and forth 
uh, in regard to some of the test results that are used for the modeling. Um, you know, starting from from you know me mega ductor or you know uh, the insulation test, and and also you you identified um, partial discharge as as a critical uh, uh, component uh, to evaluate the the asset. The question I have is uh, is that you know do you have a, a, you know obviously EA is involved in online partial discharge, but then there is also the offline partial discharge testing. What parameters are supposed to be inserted to the tool, and which ones are the you know I know, I know offline may be more reliable, but what's your take on it? I don't know if George, you want to sort of come in on that. Um, because, yeah, George is from our um, US office, and um, I mean, yes, on, online is usually is usually preferable. I think when you are assessing asset health, then you you don't want your values changing all the time. You want a, a general measurement because what you're what you're often doing is looking at um, sort of medium to long term investments. I think where the online monitoring is particularly strong is looking for um, sort of your short term and more immediate um, your more immediate problems. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that, George. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the issue, I, I think uh, you can input both into certainly you can in, input both, but um, when you look at offline, uh, there's just a resource limitation. If, if you did an offline test on every single asset, you'd be taking it in and out of service. It's just not practical. So yeah. the, the online test would be used as a screening tool for, uh, as Joanne says, the uh, short term. And then uh, you can, you know, include those uh, Offline tests for the for the equipment that you do a, even a visual inspection could be considered an, an offline test, but you, you got to pick and choose which ones and and those are more you know day to day maintenance uh, issues. But uh, you know certainly you can uh, collect all that data and try to uh, extrapolate, um, especially if you're looking at uh, like you're close to the uh, uh, a body of water or uh, things like that, you, you know, factor all those other things too. So the tool can accept both? Hmm. The offline results and online results? Yeah, the um, the tool, I mean, in, in common methodology and the tool we use, um, Usually, it accepts um, a, a, if you like, a single rating for each yeah. individual asset. Um, okay. So it doesn't do that. Um, yeah, it just looks at, it looks for one rating for one asset, and that's really so that it can make this sort of long term, medium to long term judgment about the condition of that asset as it currently is. Um, so, so that's why it, it does that. Okay, understood. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions for Joanne? You can uh, unmute yourself. Quiet. <laughs> yeah, a lot of quiet. Well, I guess you, you, you explained everything. <laughs> there, everyone's an expert now. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you for uh, uh, working out the time zone so that you could uh, uh, present here uh, in, in our air, uh, uh, time zones here. Joanne, I appreciate it. I uh, hope uh, it was very informative for everyone. And um, We'll, we'll get a uh, recording out to you so you can share it to your co-workers as well. Thanks. Thanks, George. Yeah. Well, Thank you, Joanne. It's a good presentation. Oh, I enjoyed very it. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You're going to close, close it much. out? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just close by saying that um, we will be doing another webinar. Um, so we're going to try and get one of these out every month. Um, so the next one is really more about asset health and, and risk. So I appreciate that. I sort of whistle through some of those, um, the asset health methodology and the risk methodology um, without explaining it in much detail. Um, we'll, we'll go into more detail of that in the next webinar. Um, so, yeah, it'd be nice to sort of see you all again at some point. Um, if you have any questions, like I say, please get in touch and uh, yeah, I hope, you, hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Thanks.